Hello, and welcome back to Old School Coding, where we are working in C99 uh, using techniques from the late 80s, early 90s to build a cycle, well, a signal accurate simulation of a set of CPUs and systems from the early 90s and late 80s. Uh, currently, I am focused on getting an 8080 based system working. I think in the long run, I'm going to do some simulations of some other CPUs of the era, 6502 and 1802 come to mind. 6809 is a perennial favorite. Uh, Long-term, I'd like to build up a stable of simulated modules. Uh, who knows, maybe someday I'll even get a, a series of 32 and 64-bit CPUs going. And someday in the future, I will have a historical simulation of, well, whatever it is we're, we're doing tomorrow. So latest and greatest Intel and AMD chips will someday be historical. Anyway, <clears throat> that's looking to the future. The reason why I'm looking to the future is we reached that milestone on this project where we have a basically functional microcomputer. We've got a simulation of an 8080 and all of its support chips that is cycle accurate. Well, it is accurate to quantized cycles, quantized signals, uh, so single accurate, quantized signal accurate, uh, with a couple of exceptions. I did not yet do interrupt support or DMA support because this first microcomputer we're working on uh, doesn't have it. Has no need of it. If we're going to be doing disk I.O., we really have nothing else to do. I mean, the, the program that is running has said, please move some data from the disk, and it doesn't want control back until it's done. So PIO is just fine. Uh, the disk controller we're emulating um, is infinitely fast. So you tell it what you want to read, and you start reading data from it, and there's no wait states. You just get the data. So if we were to run programs of the time, they would be shocked, I tell you, shocked at how fast the disk was. because that's actually the simplest thing to do. Anyway, so we have a basically functional system. And I started thinking about where we wanted to go with it. Uh, this is why I've been thinking about more CPUs and more systems, but before we can get there, we actually need, for example, our mass storage to store data in the file system so that we can <clears throat> boot the system today and do something and write something to disk and then boot the system tomorrow, and that data will be on the disk. So I needed to make the, the disk store data persistently you know, on, onto, onto the uh, host system drives. Uh, I also was using a TCP server <clears throat> on my host system to handle terminal stuff because it was... Uh, a little more modern than I wanted to bring in. It wasn't really written to old school coding rules. But I broke down and I grabbed it. And I basically yanked out all of the stuff that's more modern than about 1992. And I have brought in, see on the right, there's a UTL directory, which is going to be standalone utilities. Uh, basically, each file here is going to turn into a program. I have two of them. So we have BDEV format, which creates disk files, which are going to look like disks. So uh, I have settled on a format for the storage for BDEV. Basically, I'm going to have a file on disk, a uh, file on the host disk for each drive in the system. And it's going to have the data that's there. And I'll handle, if, you, if we're going to simulate the idea of, I'm going to take a disk out, I'm going to put another disk in, Basically, that will be copying data to and from these files. So let's go take a look at what that looks like, BDEV. And the paradigm I'm using for accessing these, um, now I could use reads and writes, which means my disk controller would have to <clears throat> issue a read call to the host system to read a sector, and that would have to feed it to the, to the chip. But even easier, it's a trick that I've been using since 1989, maybe earlier. Under Unix, there's the idea of memory mapping. Now, this really became, you know, it came into, into its full glory 
uh, when we when we got to Sun OS four, uh, where basically you know everything was a virtual page, okay, and it would be backed by storage. Now most of your you, know, you ran a program. Classically, it would allocate space on a swap drive. It would bring your program into memory, and if it had to use your physical memory pages for something else, anything you modified went out to the swap drive and it came back and then was slow. Uh, well, anytime you go to disk, is slow. But the idea of having pages backed by swap was a good one. And instead of having an entire area of swap for your program at all of its address space, what we started seeing was a virtual page of memory was associated with a page of storage on disk somewhere. And often that would be swapped. But for instance, for your program text, you know, the code itself, which doesn't change, that would be backed by the actual executable file. So <clears throat> you would just execute, and if it needed to put that data out and say, oh, the, the, the in-memory page is clean, I can discard it, and it's backed by that disk over there. And if you needed that page again, it would bring it back in from disk, would bring it back in from the executable. So that was born MMAP, memory map. The other thing is you can MMAP a file. So I can say, here's a file on disk. Please associate this address range in my address space with that file on disk. And if I read from an address, it will give me the data that's at that offset in the file. Okay. If my virtual page isn't there, it will read it in from that disk file into that page of virtual memory, and I can then look at it. If I modify it later on, <clears throat> sometime down the road, after the, you know, that page will be dirty, well, it gets dirty when I modify it, but down the road it'll notice it's a dirty page, and either when the program terminates and we're, we're pushing all of our dirty pages back to their backing storage, or... Possibly before, if that virtual page is needed for something else, writes it back to its backing page, which is that file. So I've decided to use MMAP. This means that my code in the simulator just says this address range is, is the volume. And I can read and write it just like it's an array, because it really is. And I have confidence that that data that I've updated will then be pushed back. I had to make sure that this still works under WSL on Windows because there are a number of features of operating systems of the 90s that, um, let's just say it took Microsoft a while to cotton to them. Um, I don't know whether modern Windows has an equivalent of MMAP. It probably does because it's bloody useful. Whether it works the same, I don't know and I don't care. Uh, I'm using the WSL2 environment when I'm working under Windows, which I'm doing all of my streaming from Windows these days. It, I can stream from Linux, from the, from the I've got a dual boot system, do my coding under Linux. But when I'm streaming, I, I wanna run under Windows because it's got all the, all the other fancies. I've got OBS set up much better under, under Windows. I've got all my plugins, I've got everything configured and tuned. I don't wanna have to do that again under Linux. And really good support for my microphone under, under Windows. Uh, often third-party device vendors, um, they will provide support, but their support is going to be better for the environments where they have more users. So, for instance, Elgato <clears throat> provides very nice support under Windows and basic support under Linux, because they don't have a whole lot of people that are dependent upon Linux for their products. So, streaming from Windows, I need to make sure that the, all this worked, and under WSL2, which actually has a real Linux install, has a real Linux kernel, um, it works. And in fact, I was recently puttering around trying to do some data recovery when the system crashed and had to be reinstalled. And under WSL2, the disk drive images for the WSL environments are, in fact, virtual disks. Which tells me it really, really is Linux running in a VM uh, in some ways. Now, performance is great, uh, so it's got to be a very efficient VM, but it's still a VM. Anyway, so 
all that is water under the bridge. We have deduced that MMAP works. And to test that, I wrote this format program. Let's go through it really quick. I'm gonna make that my first bit of code review for the day. This is not actually the order that I did things in. But it's the order we're discussing them in. So the idea is I want a file on disk that has the proper size that I can mmap it in and treat it as a drive volume. <clears throat> and I'm going to want to put some stuff on that disk. Now, a normal floppy disk you would format, which means that you would step the controller through each track of the disk, and then on the track, you would lay down a bit pattern. And the controller would usually do this for you, where uh, you would have marks that say, here starts a sector, and then you would identify the sector and the track number, and then it would give you the data. Uh, so there are synchronization primitives on the actual media that say, here starts a sector. There's some metadata so that you can drop the head onto the disk, you can find out what track and what sector am I looking at. So that if you want a different track and sector, you can you know, step the head in and out to get to the right track. You can wait for the right sector. We don't need to do that because we are simulating a mass storage device with basically a big array of, of random access memory. So our format is going to be much simpler. Um, I've chosen these MMAP files to start at the beginning of the file, the data contents of the first sector of the first track. So byte zero of the file is byte zero of the first track, first sector. And we'll just lay the sector out, bit, 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 well, byte, 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 byte. However big the sector is. Where it ends, we'll immediately start with the first byte of the second sector, and so on, all the way through all the sectors of the first track, which is track zero commonly. Interestingly enough, first track is track zero, first sector is sector one. What idiot came up with that convention? <clears throat> These are numbers from the IBM single-sided, single-density uh, disk drives, diskette drives, 8-inch diskettes. Uh, everybody uses this, and I don't know who originated it, but whoever they are needs to be smacked over the head with a raw mackerel to use a, an old punishment from, from computer labs of the late 70s and early 80s. Anyway, <clears throat> once you got the first track laid out, second track is adjacent to it. So really what this array is, is just the data from the disk. So what do we want to format it to? Well, it just needs to be the right length so we can mmap it, right? The second thing is what is its content? Well, its content is arbitrary. So I'm going to say that a freshly formatted disk is just filled with zeros. There we go. But a disk full of zeros isn't going to do us any good. We can't you know, it can't boot from it, can't do anything reasonable from it. So part of what format is going to do is I'm also going to use the same utility since I've got the file open anyway. And oh, part of this is I want to exercise the MMAP facility. This code was actually written to test MMAP. Okay, so we're going to open it. We're going to, we're going to create the file. We're going to set its length. We're going to MMAP the whole thing in. And then we're going to use memory operations to set the data inside that MMAP file the way we want it. Well, I also want to add some hex files. And what I'll do is each of these hex files represents some data for disk. Now, hex records, um, mostly they're type zero records, which say at this memory address, put this data. And customarily, these are in ascending order. Okay. So what I'm going to say is we have a, a current location on disk where we're writing. I'll start reading the first text file and the first byte of data it sends out, we'll put it where we're writing. And then from then on in the file, where we put it on disk is, is basically the relative offset. So, so if the disk says, put this byte at 80, 80 hex, and this byte at 88 hex, the byte at 80 hex would go in at the start of the first sector, and then 88 would go at offset eight, and so on. So we'll end up with an image on disk of the thing the hex file describes, the binary the hex file describes, uh, aligns so that the first byte written goes at the beginning of the disk. And if for some reason the you know, a subsequent record has an address which is less than the first record, um, sort your hex files, guys. This is not normal. Um, 
I, I think that if you used org statements in your ASM files to move org or the origin around a lot, you might get this. But for the purposes of format, basically what we're looking at here is we want to put out a boot sector and we want to put out the thing it boots, which would be, for instance, um, the cold loader for CPM followed by the CPM image, which has a CCP and a BDOS and a BIOS, or the cold loader for fourth and then the image of fourth. These are all important things. Uh, they're, they're the boot, cold boot and the booted image. We can put requirements on that. So I'm going to require that the first type zero record in the hex file is the lowest thing that we put out there. Otherwise, I would have to parse the hex file twice and then find the, first, you know, find the lowest number byte and do something. That's, that's crappy. Uh, when we go to a second hex file, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cursor that I've been, you know, my high water mark, so the highest byte I wrote to disk, and I'm going to skip ahead to the beginning of the next sector to write this. So in practice, this first hex file is going to be our cold loader, which might only be 31 or 32 bytes long. It might be 17 bytes long. Uh, it might be 128 bytes long. So that would place the next guy at the next sector after that, which for, you know, from common drives, it's going to be, you know, offset 128. Uh, I am allowing for formatting of media that has differing numbers of bytes per sector. So SS is sector size. Mostly it's 128. I'm ringing bells in the back of my head with memories that uh, when I started working with Suns, uh, I believe the first disk drives I used on Suns had sector sizes of 512 bytes. And I do not remember where it went from there because at some point you, you just leave it as a pound to find somewhere you don't care. Kind of like page size where uh, <clears throat> on our Sun 4s, you know, some things were 4K page size, some things were 8K page size. I think there was some 2K page sizes in there somewhere. Anyway, constants like that, you learn the constant if it's always one value. And if it's always one value, nobody cares. And when it varies, you learn the name of the constant and you just bear in mind that it's got multiple values and you don't remember long-term what it is. So, Given that I'm, <clears throat> I'm not packaging up all of my existing code as a library, so I can't just call the hex loader, which means I have to actually have a copy of hex parse here. That's not, not too bad. If I start seeing a lot of code in the util directory that's common, what I'll do is I'll make a library under util we can build up, and we link all of our utilities to that library, and then maybe we link the simulation of that library as well so we can share hex parse between utilities and the system and anything else. We may end up with a generalized routine that says, please open this disk drive, which would be common between the simulation and the utilities. So, a little bit of jiggery pokery here. We're not using any fancy command line processors. A uh, common practice of the day was there were command line processors, and you did not often use them, because often what you wanted was something much simpler. Uh, you take a look at the command line processors that you can grab uh, from GNU and so on, uh, which were available in the day, uh, somewhat simplified, but they were there. And standards that you come up with when you're trying to support projects like GCC, which have a huge number of parameters. Uh, you, you end up with command line processors that are driven by big tables that say, okay, we have these single character flags, which do these things. Then we have these flag words, which is dash, dash, word, and some of them have values and some of them don't. It becomes huge, and it is a lot more code than you would want for a trivia utility. So, for instance, all I want to do here is peel off the name of the drive file, how many bytes per sector, how many sectors per track, and yes, I should be packaging that up in a subroutine. Shoot me now. Uh, I was a bad boy. I'm putting too much inline code in this particular main function. Basically, main does everything <clears throat> until it calls the uh, processing of the hex files. Mainly, I wanted to work out how to do these. And the, everything down to where my cursor is now, where we have this printf, this is all just 
processing the command line parameters, I'm pulling out sector size and sectors per track as special things. Then we have something called open drive. So I open the drive, I set its size, I get the system page size and I round it. When we end mapping, when you're mapping in a file into memory, the amount of data you're mapping has to be a multiple of the virtual page size. Now, if it's not for some reason, mmap on Ubuntu, on WSL2, on Windows 10 is not giving me an error if my map size is not aligned. It should be giving me enval, but it's not. Also, it's not putting in a red zone above what I'm mapping, which means that if I access off the end of mapped memory, I'm going on into the next thing. So, for instance, if it is mapping, if we had something else mapped and we mapped, did a new mapping of the drive, it would go off the end of my drive and the next address would be something else. What I really wanted was a SIG SEGV. So if we tried to access off the end of the drive, we'd get a segmentation violation. We're not there. So I just need to be careful. That's guy. Okay. I should be range checking my accesses anyway, right? I mean, this is C. You can shoot yourself in both feet if you want to, but uh, some of us prefer to have little shields around things that says, okay, um, don't, don't shoot your toes. So page size, we round up our, our computed size of the drive. We round it up to a page size, and that's the size that we map. Once you've mapped a file in, you can close it. Yeah, let me repeat that. You do not need an open file descriptor describing a file from which you have mapped memory. So you can map memory from my file and you can close the file and the system will understand that that file is still active because you've got stuff mapped from it. Okay. So here's where we format the disk. We're just going to write zeros. Whole thing's zero. The rest of this is the complexity around the logic I described earlier about how you <clears throat> how you write each hex file onto the disk so that it starts at the next byte. And then between the hex files, you step your cursor forward to the next page. And this is all just straight line, um, <clears throat> grind it through code. I ended up adding, I have a disk store context that I passed through. The model of this parser, hex parse, is that it parses the hex file, and then for each byte, it calls through to this function. I need to pass in a context, and the context gets things like geometry of the disk, so we can not just you know, round up to the next sector, but I want to have it be able to print something about tracks and sectors, so I'm going to give it that. Uh, if we decide not to print it, I'll probably keep the fields in case we want to put that back in. Obviously, when you're writing bytes to a disk, the guy that's doing it needs to know where the disk is mapped in memory here. It needs to know the actual size of the disk so it can range check and only write bytes that go on to that range. And needs some scratch, pay, scratch space to track the high watermark of where it's written data on the disk. Now, as we process each file, inside the context, we're gonna say, well, FFB adder, so file first byte, we have not yet determined the address from the hex file representing its starting byte. Um, <clears throat> I what I used FFB off. FF, file first byte offset is, ah. So FFB adder is the address is the minimum is the the first address we we write to ffb offset is the first offset on the disk okay that we're going to write to so that's minus one so the first time we do a write we're going to have to work out you know, we're given an address we're going to have to work out what the disk offset is once we've got those two going then any other address we come up with we can do math with ffb adder and ffb off to come up with or on the disk to write and file high watermark is going to store the highest address in the file. Uh, I believe it's highest address. Let's make sure. 
Yes. File HWM is going to store the highest adder value to which the address, you know, the, where the hex file tried to store some data. So for instance, if it was 128 bytes of data starting at 80 hex, then file high watermark would be 255. Do the hex parse, which does the whole file. So it's gonna cop, you know, grab the hex file and put all its bytes in place in the disk. Then we come up here and we're gonna print <clears throat> all this stuff here is just to do this print. I wanna print out the file, the, the final address from the file, highest byte address written. And I'm going to say what track and sector it went into. So now for each byte, okay, each byte stored by the hex parser. This is just my, my usual guff because I'm working in C, not C++. I like to have a local variable with the name of the field so I can just say if FB adder less than zero, blah -de blah That does mean that if I update FB adder, I have to explicitly write it back like here. <clears throat> And here, anyway, so I grab all the fields and I say, well, um, if we don't know the address and the, we have to have know both the address and the offset. Now they're both gonna be negative or they're both gonna be zero or positive. But if either one of them is negative then something screwy has happened and we need to, need to start over again. So we store off the address from the file, assuming it's gonna, you know, this is gonna be our, our first byte, it's gonna go at the beginning of the sector. So we're going to take the current disk high water mark. This is really divide by sector size, round up and multiply by sector size again. And nothing special. Bada boom. Okay. Uh, the other way of doing this is to decrement, divide, and increment, but that doesn't work if you start out as zero or minus one because you decrement minus one, you get to minus two, you divide by sector size, you get zero, increment, you get one. So this would do the wrong thing at the first sector if we did a decrement, uh, divide, multiply, increment. So instead we are going to <clears throat> increment to one more sector minus a byte and then divide by sector size. So for the beginning of a sector, this gets back our sector number. If we're not at the beginning, it's going to get us back the sector of the next sector. That gets us these values, which are the critical values we wanted to store as we had our new file, which is the address of the image from the file and the location on the disk that match. Okay. And again, I have braced this off because it's a little bit of extra math so that I can print out the track number and the sector number. So if we, if this isn't true, this means FFB adder and FFB off are already set. What I'm going to say is I'm going to assert that my address is greater than or equal to FB adder. So I'm going to assert that we do not get any, if we ever get any more data from the hex file that goes before the first byte, we're done. Okay, down here, update file high watermark. So we say if file high watermark is less than adder, then it's equal to adder, boom, we're done. Uh, I, I'm going to reuse adder here. I'm going to get, you know, change adder to the offset in the address space in the file data, the current byte. And then we're going to offset it again by where we want to land on disk. We're going to check that that's within the disk image. And then we're going to store the data and uh, update the disk high watermark as there. So this is all the stuff that happens on each byte coming in. Hex parse is just the hex parse function from the main line. I believe we went over this when we set it up initially. Uh, this is a standard parser for the Intel hex format files, which has been tested for the very, very old formats, which only had type zero and type one. So you had a bunch of type zero data records, which is a colon, followed by a length, followed by an address, followed by a type. <laughs> Um, oh yes, Intel hex format. Format only Fortran heads can love. I got, I learned Fortran as my first programming language, so I don't have any problem with this at all. Um, interestingly enough, Intel hex format doesn't demand each one of these colon records is on its own line. It says, basically, you start reading data. 
And when you see a colon, you start processing it, which means this could be big old text file. As long as you don't have a colon anywhere, you're just going to skip it. The moment you see a colon, okay, we are going to require two hexadecimal um, digits, which is going to be a size value for this record. It's actually the size of the payload. Then we're going to get four hex digits, and that's going to be a word address. Okay, and then we're going to get two bytes, which is a type. Now type zero data, type zero records have a number of bytes of data. So we get two hex digits and that's representing a byte, which we store. And the number of these is determined by the size value we just picked up. Hmm, how about that? <clears throat> if your type is one, this is a type one record, we are done. And Intel hex format does not tell us anything at all about what you might want to do with the size field or the address field, given that you're a type one record. Now, Intel hex format does define some additional things. Uh, these did not exist back when the hex files I'm talking about would have been created. So if you were sitting there and 1979 and you were assembling stuff to paper tape you likely had type 0 type 1 records that was all you ever worried about type 2 records um we're going to get into more modern modern quote, processing here um with the advent of the 8086 a 16-bit processor uh 64 kilobytes of memory was just not going to cut it anymore we needed to go bigger so the model Intel chose to use a segment model where you had, instead of a 16-bit address register, you had a 16-bit segment register and a 16-bit offset register. And the way you calculate the address was you took your segment register and you left shifted by four bits. And that was a base address of a segment in memory. So your memory was a megabyte, okay? And the segment register told you where in that megabyte this segment started. So you could have a segment, code segment over here or over there or over there. This is also nice for switching from program to program. You have multiple programs resident in memory and you just would have their segment address proper. And then the other half of it, the other, the, the uh, offset was a 16 bit address, which was an offset from the start of the segment. So as long as you only looked at the offset, you thought your, your stuff all started at zero. And in fact, one of the models of the day would have your, your code segment, your data segment, your BSS segment, you know, all your, your whatever segments the processor supported would all have the same value. And you would own 64 kilobytes of memory at a given address. And you would just work with the offsets within the segments. You didn't touch the segment registers and you just ran. And programs that used this model, you could put them throughout memory each one of them would be happy and wouldn't care where in memory it was as long as its segment registers were set properly. So this case two is supporting this. It says uh, when you load this hex file, load this data using address computation for this segment address. Okay, so the base address that we, we got, well, the value that we get in the record is base. Now, I would have used adder for this. But no, they actually put in two more bytes for base. I need to verify this. This doesn't make sense. Why didn't they reuse adder? I don't know. Now, three. You know. Uh, oh, right. Record type three, I believe, this is what I'm guessing, represents the entry point for the program. So you've got a program on tape. It's specified its segment registers. It's specified the data that goes into them. And here it is saying, when you want to start execution of this program, code segment address, the I believe, I believe, I am guessing this, is that this is the segment address, segment value and the offset value 
to use when you want to start an execution. Now, type four says, okay, we only need to go beyond the segment mode. We do not have a one megabyte address space. We now have a 32 bit address space, extended linear address. And <clears throat> all of the incoming stuff up here, this is all 16 bit addresses. So I'm gonna say, here's a 32 bit value, which is my zero point. Do everything up above, but increment it by this basis. This is a 32 bit base address. And five gives us our 32 bit starting address. So we can see how this format grew from pure eight bit to the 16 bit one megabyte address space to the 32 bit address space here. Anyway, we won't be using types two, three, and four. We'll just be using zero and one for what we're doing because we are a little old 80. But the code is here. So when we get around to bigger CPUs, it'll work. So at the end of it, um, there is a checksum, at the end of the hex, you know, each hex record. So if you are loading something from paper tape and maybe some bug ate a hole in it somewhere or it's damaged or your reader read wrong, uh, you can check the checksum and you can entirely throw out a record if the checksum fails. Now what we're going to do is if we have a checksum failure, we are going to abort the format run here. We're going to stop processing. Now we have already acted on the corrupted data. So in theory, we should read the whole record in check the checksum, reject the record if the checksum is bad with flagging an error somewhere, and we could recover from that. And only if the checksum is good would we write the data. <clears throat> and the rest of this is by and large. Oh, 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 <laughs> down at the bottom, starting here, this is all new code. But back to the MMAP stuff. I tried to encapsulate the error, error handling. Uh, standard error handling in POSIX systems is you have system calls that return an integer value, which is negative if there's an error, and then zero or positive if there's success. So for instance, open returns a file descriptor, which is zero through n. If it returns minus one, that's an error. Remember, C programming language, no throw, no exceptions. We have signals, they tend to be fatal. <clears throat> what we're going to do in this case is we're going to uh, print an error about the drive. we we'll say probably couldn't create it. Maybe the directory doesn't exist. Um, maybe the file name is illegal. Print it in a board. So if we call open drive from our code, we know that when we're getting, if, if we return, then we know that we have a open file handle to the drive. Size drive says set the size of the drive. We're going to call F-truncate, which again, could have an error. Now, if there's an error, we need the name of the file to print. So the only reason we have the name of the file out here is so we can print. There is a truncate call that takes the name of a file instead of a file descriptor. That's a security hole. Between the time you truncate a file by name and open it by name, somebody could change the file. So much better to open the file and then truncate it. You get in this habit, and you just consistently do it, even in trivia cases like this, BDEV format has absolutely no security implications, and yet it's a habit you get into. And if you always do it, then you'll be doing it even in times when it becomes critical. Page size. Um, back in the SunOS 3, SunOS 4 days, you just called get page size. Get page size got deprecated because there was get this, get that, get the other. We started getting a whole bunch of little functions whose entire job was to report system configuration data. So <clears throat> somebody in their wisdom designed a sysconf package, which I'm not sure is a step up, uh, which you call and it might return an error. And if it doesn't return an error, it's got your page size. So again, <laughs> on error, the error and abort. Round page. So we take the size and we round up to page size like that. Uh, I could just have called this roundup and I could have used it for rounding up things everywhere, but I didn't. And I have a call called map. This basically takes an M map and wraps it. Now, notice the fancy dancing here. 
actual system call interface at the machine code level uses some common code, which always returns an integer and it always returns negative on an error. So MMAP wants to return an address. Works really well as long as addresses fit within an integer, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, this got squirrely <clears throat> from time to time. Uh, but the net effect is something you still do. Uh, basically, you have a void pointer. MMAP is declared to return a void star. So you grab the uh, return value of MMAP and you say, if I took a minus one and cast it into a void star, would that match what I got back? We don't want to take VP and cast it into an integer because on some machines, integer is smaller than pointer. We don't want to cast it along because on some machines, long is not the same size as pointer. We don't want to use long long because long long isn't a standard. Uh, long long started coming into play at some point while I was in, uh, doing this old school stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid using it because this style of coding dates from a time when long long wasn't available yet or was just starting to become available and wasn't always cool, uh, or you never knew and you might be using a compiler that didn't support it. So, so instead of casting VP to something and compare it with minus one, we specifically take a minus one and cast it into a void star and compare it. And I am really surprised the C compiler did not give me warnings about this because void star minus one is completely freaking meaningless. There is nothing in any standard that says what a pointer looks like. Pointer might be a linear address. Uh, it might be a segment and an offset within the segment. There might be protections in the system where you can't even construct a pointer that doesn't have a valid segment number. So construction of void star minus one might be illegal. Uh, on the other hand, this is happening on the host. And these days, our, our likely hosts will be um, Intel and AMD 64-bit processors, which we do this just fine on. We might conceivably do it on an Apple M1. We might conceivably do it on high-end ARM chips. Uh, if I ever got my hands on a, on a Sun, oh, I would love to have a working Stingray or Galaxy machine handy, but if I could afford the power. <clears throat> Um, they were they were nice little 25 megahertz Spark machines back in the day. Very nice. The Galaxy was a departmental server. Good machine. So my best work on Galaxy. Anyway, um, potentially Spark MIPS would all be capable of running this. Um, I think it was Intel 432 where some compilers might have choked on this. Possibly the Itanium might have choked on this. I'm not sure. But the machines where this doesn't work, uh, we don't see those anymore. Uh, they tend to be very protective. And it looks like, hold on. Indentation doesn't feel right in this file. Uh, I suspect that size T, oh, Int and pointer types. What is different about this? Right. There we go. Interesting that it chooses to space this out. I declare this to return to void.
That is interesting. So indent is um, <clears throat> inconsistent on how it indents the name of a function on the static declaration line. I never noticed that before. Not too critical. I mean, we're getting the indentation right in these tables, which is where it's actually important. Uh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so it is indeed calling a dent on utilisio.c and It'll be dev format dot C. So yeah, indent has never been perfect. Hey, anyway, so let's be dev. So that covers the, the big change in the block device code. Uh, we will be, have not yet, but we will be hooking up the BDEV simulation itself to use MMAP to store its data. We haven't done that yet. I left that to do something, I left that as something to do on the stream. The other one is the SIO. Uh, this is a reduced form of the TCP server that I'd be using for serial device control, uh, which I have opted to, again, leave way too much in main uh, because it doesn't do a whole lot. Let's walk through it. For people who are not familiar with sockets in the TCP networking world, <clears throat> a socket is basically a thing that you open, which would be kind of like a serial device in that you can read and write bytes from it. Um, on the client side, you open up a socket and you connect to a server, and now you have a bi-directional connection to the server. You can write stuff into the socket and the server will see it. And the server can put stuff into the connection and you can see it. On the server side, it's a little more complicated. Uh, you create a socket and you say, I'm going to listen. So what are the steps here? This is the server side again. We create a socket. Eventually we'll do reads and writes on sockets. But first we need to arrange to receive a client connection. Those of you that have worked on backend code, uh, yeah, yeah, this is this is exactly what backend code does. So uh, we need to bind it. We need to tell the system uh, if you have a connection request come in on this, you know, for this IP address, for this port number, please send it to us. And because I am forever mired in uh, old, old stuff. This is IPv4, which is a 32-bit numeric address. It's not IPv6. Thank you. Um, basically, we say AFI net, so it's IPv4. Loopback address is what we're using. Um, all modern systems, even systems configured for IPv6 only, I believe still honor binding things to the loopback address. If not, well, okay, if I ever have to run this on a system that has no IPv4 support, then I will rewrite this code to use IPv6. Fine. Um, convert our port from host to network order. Um, IP uses the perfect network or the perfect byte order, which is most significant byte first. If you read a word, you alphabetize a list, the first character is most significant. You're comparing two numbers of the same length. First digit is most important. Okay? You write numbers with the most, most significant digit first. So a big Indian is the way it should be. Intel, foolishly, decided to store multi-byte quantities starting at the low byte. And that has been a mistake of the same level of insanity as the invention of the null pointer. 
Okay. Anyway, so we have to take this number and shift it around so that when this CPU stores it as a short into port, the bytes that land in this field of this structure are organized as this value in network byte order. And then we bind, which basically is a system call that tells the system uh, this socket is going to receive connection requests at that address. We, uh, if we terminate, normally if you have a server bound to a port and the server goes away for security reasons, you don't want somebody to reconnect to that port immediately. So if I'm connecting to port 43 and it's our secure whatever, uh, I don't want some attacker to on the system to be able to kill a service and capture the port number and my thing connecting to that port number suddenly is talking to that program. So there is a delay between when a server shuts down and when that port number can be bound to again. And what we're doing here is we're turning that off. I'm saying that if this server goes down, I want somebody to be able to connect, you know, to be able to listen on that port, to bind to that port and listen immediately. So that means I can kill this server and restart it. And I don't need to wait the 30 seconds or whatever it is between them. Uh, the downside is that somebody else could kill my server and bind to that port and incoming traffic would now go to them. So next thing you do is you tell the system, I want to do a listen. So binding to a port doesn't necessarily say you're a server, but doing a listen says, you're, says you are. And that tells the network support code inside the kernel that um, I am expecting somebody to attempt to connect. So this is a, you know, the, the whole TCP handshake comes in and the host will handle that in the networking stack. And this says, uh, I expect there to be as many as 10 connection requests that arrive on that thing before I can service them. So you can say how long the queue is. In the case of this particular program, I'm only going to accept one connection. Okay. Uh, only one person is going to be talking to my TTY or CRT at a time. But again, this is one of the things I do out of habit is I always set a backlog that's reasonable. So that later, if I want to modify this program, I don't have to go back and remember all of the configuration things. So 10 is a reasonable backlog. Get a burst of 10 requests that comes in before you service the first one, we're fine. <clears throat> Once that's done, I'm going to print ready. Um, hold on. I just realized that as I reconfigured things, I did not actually have a... Uh, OBS window set up for the, let me set those up real quick. So window capture, uh, source, the, uh, bum, bum, Let's put that there. Gonna bring these up one at a time. CRT, we have a printing, so there's our video terminal and printing terminal. Made that in over there. And have a I'm going to fade in right there in the middle. So currently I have three devices ready to go. Uh, I do not know whether that is going to be readable or not.
The CRT definitely is the printing terminal may be a little small. The line printer is likely too small. I may have to at some point. Um, I don't think I'm done. Let me check my settings, make sure I'm not downsizing this too much. I'm sending in 20 megabits per second. I am, oh, okay, I'm sending this one-to-one. -one. So the video should be 2560 by 1440, which means that um, assuming you all are playing it on a screen that is big enough, that should be readable. But if we ever have to look in detail at the contents of those windows, I will do something appropriate. Let's turn those off. I'm going to very quickly show. So there's there's what prints when you start this running. TCP, TTY, ready to connect on port 2502. And <clears throat> this is something where I forgot to change a name. TCP, TTY is the name of the program on my host system that actually has a few more bells and whistles. Uh, but it it's more new school than old school. So. And the process of bringing it over to old school, I didn't change the, that. Come over there and I'll turn it off. Uh... So next time we rebuild, I will change that message so it just says SIO ready to connect. So at some point, the simulation will pop up a client, will start a client going, and will connect to the server. Uh, how that is reflected is the, this call, this accept call will return. And what the accept call does, it waits until somebody is on our backlog and finishes up any negotiation with them and then returns to us having copied its address information into this client address area, which needs to be big enough. We pass in a pointer to the length, which is initialized to the length of the storage we gave it. It fills in things that adjust length appropriately. And now we can print, accept the connection on port from port. So we can say, here's the port we were listening on. Here is the port number of the client. We actually have the client IP address as well, but we're a local host only. So it doesn't matter, don't need to print it. Then we drop down into a little loop, which is just copying. Um, remember if I put that window back up here. The idea is as I Let's let's put up the uh, the uh, printing TTY real quick. This is the one that actually I got churning data back and forth. Uh, our boot monitor does things in here. So if I type characters into the printing terminal window, they will go to the simulation. And anything the simulation sends to us will appear in that window. And how we do that <clears throat> is this call called select. Uh, again, this is something where I had to be absolutely sure it worked. Uh, depending on how WSL was implemented, and I've actually gotten much more comp and much more comfortable and confident in WSL uh, having done these things. But there was the possibility that the Linux emulation might not have handled select properly under Windows. Uh, we needed to handle select for network connections, for terminal connections, and for sockets for files, for everything. So sockets are a network, but anyway. And there was a possibility that Windows might be a little cranky. It might require its own calls to make it work. And we're under WSL and all the, all the WSL, Unix, Linux, POSIX rules apply here. Um, basically we decide which ports we're interested in. Now, the more deluxe version actually had uh, more robust queuing this version, I just basically have uh, an idea that 
I have some data from standard input to send to the connection. I have some data from the connection to send to the output. I'm only doing one byte at a time. So, the way select works here is it says, uh, I am interested in this many file descriptors in the system. Okay, so if I'm interested in descriptors one and six, this would be seven. Read FDs, write FDs, and exception FDs, these are addresses of basically big bit factors, which are handled for us. Uh, I'm basically saying, I'm going to turn on a bit and read FDs for every file descriptor that I'm interested in reading from. And I'm going to turn on a bit and write FDs for every file descriptor I'm interested in writing to. And then there's exception FDs for um, descriptors we're interested in checking for exceptions on, and that's out of scope for this. And then there's a timeout that says, if nothing happens for this long, come back at me. So how the user set up is, if I don't currently have any data pending to move from standard input to the connection, then I'm interested in reading from file descriptor zero, which is standard input. And if I don't currently have data waiting, to, you know, we don't have data from the connection waiting to go to standard output, then I'm interested in reading from the connection. So that's read FDs. Read FD is similar. If I have a character waiting to go to standard output, then I'm going to write a bit of write FDs. And if I have a character waiting to go to the connection, I am going to set that bit. So select returns negative for error. There's that thin macro that we keep using. Otherwise, it returns the number of bits it left on. What it does is it goes into these bit masks and it checks to see if any of the channels, any of the FDs described, I can read from or write to. And it leaves the bit on for ones it can, and it turns the bit off for ones it can't. And if anybody can be read or can be written, it returns. Otherwise, it will wait until this timeout is done or until one of these guys becomes readable or writable. It returns the number of bits. Uh, often in systems where you're having a little bit of data going back and forth, you only get one out of select. But it'll be all these, checking all these in parallel in the system, so we don't have to have a thread for each one. So if select is greater than zero, and bit zero is turned on, and read FTs, I have data on, on the input. I'm gonna read that byte of data, into the buffer and note that I have one pending and there's a little error check here. This should never fire. Uh, in fact, I am going to, oh, there's a case where it does fire. Um, if we get an end of file, then read can return zero. We're ready to read the end of file marker, which returns the size of zero. That's a standard termination. Uh, because we normally run this on a TTY and raw mode. There's no way to put in an end of file on that. But if it's not raw, it is possible to send in an end of file, so we handle it. Same thing for the network connection. If we have data on the network connection and we have space in our buffer, okay, then we read it. If we got an end of file, we are done. Otherwise, we have data pending. Same thing with writes. Uh, if the output channel is ready to go, and we only asked about that if we had data ready, then we write it and longer have data pending. <clears throat> um, it is possible for a write to return zero, in which case we're done. Because there's, you know, it's like the, the TTY is channel. The TTY hung up. The TTY is actually a connection to a network thing that has been terminated, and so on. Same thing with here. If our connection goes down, we're gonna write our data, we're gonna get a zero back, and we're done. All done. Notice I'm printing carriage return line feed. Uh, we do not need to have more than one carriage. I'm going to do one line feed followed by carriage return. So line feed, carriage return, line feed, line feed. Gives us a little bit of white space. Session from port, whatever terminated. So wherever we are on the line, we're going to get back to the beginning, go down a line or two, and port terminated. Close connection, close the server, and return. So this is all inside main. Given that main is terminating, we do not actually need to close these. However, it's a good, pro good practice. 
and it's possible that there is some cleanup that happens when you explicitly close that happens differently if you just terminate the program. So there's our serial port handler reduced to just uh, what you do within an old school environment. <clears throat> so, what else do we want to do here? Uh, did I say I was going to do? Oh, right. The rest of the project updates. Big, big thing is I was able to find on the net confirmation <clears throat> that the CPM 2.2 assembly code for the CCP and BDOS is intended now to be free to pass around. Yay! So I found a copy of the assembly code for CCP and BDOS, which had been modified to be uh, so that they could be assembled. And I grabbed a copy of the assembler that assembles them. Uh, actually, let's... I am going... Do this a little bit different. To turn off my picture here. So, console command processor, CCP. And I'm going to assemble this for a system with 62 kilobytes of memory. Um, I have included a bit of commentary at the top showing where I got this from. What? Okay, this is actually from his stuff. Uh, I'm not sure that's where I grabbed it from. I'm going to have to chase down my sources on this again. I'm sorry. Uh, I believe these comments were from the original file because I did not grab a PLM file. I don't speak PLM. I know Gary was way into that. But CPM 2. Point, uh, CPM 2 was the version that got transcoded. CPM 1 was all written in PLM. CPM 2... They actually maintained the, the assembly code for it. So here is the CCP. This is the copyright 1979 CPM 2.2, all of its source, and we see that it's assembling just fine. And the BDOS. Also notice that I have set the origin on the command line <clears throat> to uh, appropriate addresses for a 62 kilobyte system. Uh, CPM on a distribution disk, CPM 2.2, came configured so that it resided at the top of a 20 kilobyte RAM system. And this is all EDOS, and the single quote causes my editor to think the rest of it needs to be special because the LST files are just whatever. Um, <clears throat> I don't often look at this code. So these were modified to be assemblable with a, a assembler called AS. L. And you generally would find an ASL dash current on the on the network. It's a very large parametric macro assembler that can assemble uh, assemble source code for many different CPUs. 
I saw that, I thought, let's switch to it because I will be writing simulations of CPUs other than the 8080. And ASM 8080 was fine and, and dandy. Uh, got it working to what I needed, but ASL is going to service me for future CPUs and it's a macro assembler. Unfortunately, um, where did it go? There is a CPM macro file. Diskdef.lib. Oops. I have changed my font size and now I can't get back. <laughs> there we go. So when you are configuring CPM, uh, as you write your BIOS, initially you have to have disk tables that will map in a IBM single density eight inch diskette. And those tables are well known. You can just put that in your source code. But if you have, uh, it's, it's the output of this macro file for this definition. Those numbers are available everywhere. Um, but if you are defining a system with a drive that has a different geometry, let's say a double density, double sided drive, five inch drive, what what have you, these numbers change. And the resulting image on disk changes significantly. And some of the logic is not immediately apparent. So I grabbed a copy of diskdef.lib. This is actually produced as a source file on the CPM distribution disks. And I thought, oh, maybe the, maybe our macro assembler will handle it. Spoiler alert. <clears throat> ASL almost does. But one thing I could not get ASL to do for me. Um, notice here, this def is a macro where the first parameter is DN, a disk number. And inside the macro, we want to create symbols called, you know, if DN has value two, we want to create a symbol DPB2. This kind of token pasting would work if I called this def with a two there. However, if I do this, there is no percent in ASL. I can't say replace disk with its value and then call the macro. At least I haven't figured out how to do that. And if I pass in DSK, then my Mac, my, uh, it's actually the string DSK that gets substituted in for DN here. So I have not been able to work out under ASL how to have a macro create symbols whose names include the values of parameters passed into the macro, where they, you know, like DSK is used here. So head desk a few times, and I ended up having to, the closest I could get was to write some Python code, which I think I may have gotten rid of. Oh, there it is. I guess I can turn my picture back on. So instead of running the macros, I just basically took all the macros and converted them to Python. I didn't write a macro expander. What I wrote was each macro I wrote as a Python routine, which does the same thing. And I was going to do, I was going to just use this. I thought, oh, old school. Old school, what we would have done is construct our CBIOS with the data that it works, get CPM working, and then use the CPM assembler, which does handle this, to assemble the real CBIOS. So we'd have our bootstrap CBIOS, which only handled IBM single-sided, single-density disks. We would use that system 
to construct the image of the CBIOS for real. So I'm going to keep this Python code handy, okay, because it's actually going to be able to turn out code for our other disks if we need to. Notice I have some disk definitions here for a hypothetical maximum size drive. Uh, I had a definition for a double density drive, but I looked back at, at historical records. I couldn't find a single-sided double density eight inch diskette configuration block for CPM. What I did find was a table which said there were single-sided single density, double-sided single density, double-sided double density, and they manipulated the sector sizes. Which tells me that if I wanted to go to that, uh, I probably would want to step up to CPM3 and implement the sector blocking and do a whole bunch of other stuff that comes with CPM3. I'm not ready to support CPM3 yet. Um, it's kind of out of scope of what I want to do here, which is focus on the simulator, not the code. So <clears throat> we'll just use the single-sided single density disk test for now. So this is going to go get tucked away in our back pocket in case we want them in the future. The other things we did here, um, we have boot sectors for CPM and fourth. We have a CBIOS, which is customized. We have fourth and we have the CPM stuff. Let's let take a look at some of this. Um, CPM CBIOS. This is the assembly listing file from ASL. Uh, this is V1.41, a very nice little assembler, by the way. Uh, I put a title on it, says exactly what it is. I have customized the CPM 2.2 BIOS specifically for the Voidstar 8080. And I have set the RAM size to 62. So the normal thing you would do with CPM is you would load in the distribution system. You would patch in a CBIOS for a 20 kilobyte memory system and you're done, get it working. And then you would relocate CPM using CPM utilities that knew how to relocate and work from there. Uh, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna assemble everything for a 62 kilobyte system and I'm gonna put that out on my boot tracks. <clears throat> there are uh, books on how to write CBIOS stuff. Uh, Online, what you can find uh, mainly is the CPM 2.2 level one alteration manual, whatever it's called. Um, I have deviated from it somewhat. Um, we are mostly the same. I have moved the fixed tables down below all the text. We have all of the actual code from CBIOS, from the stock CBIOS. Then we have all of the actual code that talks to the simulated system, con status, con in, con out, list, and so on. List punch reader. We have teens for talking to, well, these guys support, I decided to support IOBite, which is a Intel thing where one byte in memory says which of four consoles, which of four paper tape readers, which of four paper tape punches, and which of four listing devices are active. I've got those set up down below that. We've got the direct interaction with the CDEV devices in the Voidstar 8080. So TTY, CRT, PPT, LPT. PPT is not yet set up. I've defined it, but I have nothing on the server side for it. Um, I want to have a paper tape where we can punch a, you know, you, you do a paper tape punch and I can tell the paper tape punch side that instead, you know, where, where I would have something like this for paper tape punch, but I have this ability to say, uh, tell it a file where all data coming from the punch gets written to that file sequentially. For the reader, put a file in there and every time you read from the paper tape reader, you get data from that file. <clears throat> Drag and drop would be really cool, but for some reason, um, dragging from Windows onto an X term running in WSL, not doing what I expected. It should be spitting the file name in. I'm willing to 
to allow that it's going to spit the Windows file name in and inside WSL, um, inside my code, I'll have to say, oh, this is a Windows name. I need to go do the right thing. Um, the alternative is doing a file manager running under the X Windows system. Um, those have gotten heavy and hairy and clunky and awkward to integrate into anything but themselves. So for instance, if a window manager is GNOME related, it's going to expect the rest of its environment to be GNOME. Running X11, dudes. So I'm going to have to work out how to do paper tape punch reader. So for now, we just, it goes nowhere. I mean, it goes out to the network connection and stops. BDEV devices. Here is the code to actually manipulate BDEV. Very, very simple. There's some stock stuff. For instance, the disk parameter header stuff, this is all code directly from digital research. I mean, they say, here's how to do it. So we do it that way. Um, normally for um, home and select disk and set track and set sector and so on, you'd be storing those in memory. <clears throat> I am storing those in the disk controller, in the BDEV itself. So, you know, so I just say out. Now, if you select a disk, I'm going to reset the BDEV controller. In theory, this the idea of, of resetting BDEV is it terminates any in-process transaction. So if there's a notion of an in-process transaction, it will reset it. The current implementation doesn't care. So we set the drive number. We set the track number, set the sector number. Um, sector translation. Um, this, I believe, is directly from digital research. Uh, I'm, I'm currently not too worried about sector translation. Now for DMA, uh, our BDEV does not currently support DMA. So we are storing that in an address, DMA AD. So we got a little bit of memory tucked away somewhere we can store our DMA address, pseudo DMA address. So read and write are real simple. Grab the DMA address, set the length, move bytes into the DMA address, which we auto increment. Uh, with a real disk controller, there's several things we would do here. First off, we would have to wait until the data was ready before reading each piece bit of data. Second off, if it was doing DMA, we would be issuing a read command and then waiting for that command to complete. However, we have this magical device that produces our data, DMA address at, so when we set the sector number and the track number and so on, it will go to the beginning of whatever it is. And we start reading, uh, it will give us the data starting at that address and working its way up the disk. And we're gonna read 128 bytes, which is our sector size for CPM. Same thing with write. Grab the memory from the DMA address, send it to the drive, and we're done. Bit of a moment. Bite, bite, bite. And following that, we now have our fixed tables. Uh, currently, I believe this CBIOS has, yeah, yeah. The drives C and D I have set up as a hypothetical maximum size hard drive. The CPM thinks it's got eight megabytes. Well, eight million bytes or so. And this disk definition is basically saying that our allocation block size is 8K. So CPM will allocate 8K chunks of the disk. And it's got 1,016 of those chunks, which are available for allocation. And this last little one here says we are reserving one track on the drive. So when CPM wants to allocate the first block on the disk, it's going to be first block on the second track. It's going to be 8K, so 16 sectors. Uh, for the single density 8 inch drives, these are the stock numbers uh, 26 sectors. Um, six is the 
skew factor on the disk. Um, skew factor does not matter when you are reading in the system. So the first two tracks where CPM resides, we simply read them in in order. We allocate the disk in 1K chunks. We have 243 of those, uh, sector sizes and so on, blah, 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 and two tracks reserved. Normal stuff. The fact that I set up this drive C here, however, does increase the size of the data tables. So we are nearly out of memory. And in fact, if I try to have a drive C and a drive D and a drive B that are all different sizes, so let's say a single density and drive B was a double density, double sided, and drive C was a two meg drive and D was a eight meg drive, we would be out of space. Our, our fixed tables would go farther than the image we load from disk. Boop, boop. And data and BIOS. Now, after that, I've taken our uninitialized data and I've told the assembler where it is. And there's there's no initialization here. Um, and out the bottom, what we have available. So we could increase the BIOS text and initialize data by um, 240 bytes. Okay, so that got peeled down. That was a lot. That was a lot smaller margin earlier. I, I changed some things to make it smaller. Uh, data. Uh, this would be 162 bytes we could add to the RAM backing. So we, we have plenty of storage here. The storage area we need here is uh, CPM needs these things. They're basically uh, directory access buffers and hash tables and so on. Uh, we do not have CSS, uh, CSV2 and CSV3 or zeros um, because that's used to detect change in media. C and D drives are fixed drives, so we do not detect change media in those guys. This allows CPM to say, oh, I noticed that your drive uh, has a different disk in it because the, uh, the directory is, is different. So there's our BIOS. Boot CPM, this is our cold loader, which I do want to go over. Uh, I'm going over things in more detail than I'd intended today, so this is turning into an actual full-size stream, even though we're not writing any new code. Um, this is a typical cold start loader, and what I have done is I have refined two cold start loaders in parallel. I've got one for CPM and one for fourth, and they do have some differences. Um, however, I was able to restrict the differences down to some address configuration and a cold start table. So here's where things got clever. Start in the middle here with determining the address layout. So we need to know where we're getting our data from on disk, how much data we're moving and where we're putting it. So I'm going to configure us with M size equals 62. So keep M size in the mix, make it like everything else. Uh, we've got a bias. We've got the normal computations of CPM's base and BIOS and end of BIOS, which use the bias and the known constants for CPM 2.2. And from that, we compute the number of bytes. The important things there are the memory address and the number of bytes. Now, I need to have a way of getting a whole bunch of data into registers very quickly. And in my head, the fastest way to do that is to pop things off the stack. And as long as I'm popping things off a of stack, how about the last thing I pop off the stack is the entry point, okay? So we decide where we're gonna put it. And there's a times three in here for three words. Here's my stack. The last thing you pop off, it's gonna be your entry point. So pop stack into PC. Well, that's just a 880 return instruction. We also need off in the stack, how much data we're going to move and where we're gonna move it to. So we got those two. So what do we do here at loader? Well, we set our stack pointer to point to the bottom. You see, set it here. So it points to our data table. 
And now when we do the pop, we get the first two bytes from the data table into DE, the next two into HL. So we got our transfer size, our memory load address. Uh, this minus is a, there's several ways in assemblers of having local symbols. So if you've got a really tight loop, you would put a, a name there like loop one, and down below you'd say branch on zero loop one. And then every loop would have to have a different loop. Well, I just say minus. Okay, I can dot it right J and Z minus. This will go upwards until it finds minus. This will go upwards until it finds minus. Uh, I keep my use of this very simple. There's ways of saying second minus and third minus, and there's a plus to go down and a way to do the second down and so on. But this is this is my my simplest thing. So we got our size in DE address H, so we get our data from disk. We're assuming, okay, document it up the top, we have been loaded from the boot disk from the beginning of the first sector of the first track. We just loaded it from the disk drive. B, the B dev has been loading that, okay, and it's done. It has loaded 128 bytes. So what we're doing here is we're going to say continue loading from disk where we left off. So assuming 128 byte sectors, this matches what CPM wants. If we had larger sectors, it would be reading in the rest of sector zero because boot ROM doesn't know how many bytes per sector there are. Uh, I could make loader a little bit bigger and explicitly say, please set myself to track zero sector two. Uh, I could go deluxe in here and you know, increment the sector number, and when I got to the given sector number, I would go to track, you know, track one, and that's the way the normal loader does it because you have to give these. BDEV differs from disk controllers of the time because we don't have to do anything special from sector to sector. We could just keep reading. So read it, move it to memory, increment the memory pointer, decrement the the, uh, the counter, and keep branching until the counter goes to zero. When we're done, we return, it goes to the BIOS. Fourth, old starting fourth is exactly the same process, exactly the same code. The difference is that fourth lives at 100 hex in memory. Okay, so we nail that down. We don't compute the length of four, you know, we don't compute the starting address to put it at the top, we're putting it at the bottom. Fourth is actually assembled as if it were a CPM program, but it's got, we're going to be using a fourth that talks directly to the hardware, doesn't use the CPM BIOS. Uh, we've got where we're going to load it, where we're going to start it, and the end of the image. So as I change my fourth image, I'll have to modify this, but that does mean that we could, in theory, take an existing fourth boot disk write a new fourth image on the disk, which might be longer, and then just go in and adjust that word. Okay, that 001B sitting there at address FA <clears throat> or 7A on offset into the boot record, change the size and bytes of the transfer. We don't need to reassemble it, we just do it. And this would load in all the fourth and start it running. And Fig Fourth, uh, here's our original unmodified Fig Fourth source code. That's not going to be important to us. What is important to us is the slightly modified version. And by slightly modified, I mean very slightly. Uh, I have changed the RAM size to 62 kilobytes. I have arranged for an exit monitor to jump to ROM base. And I have put code in here to do all the appropriate things with the hardware. Um, fourth is, it's interesting. Uh, the layout of these strings, for instance, you want 
to put the name of a fourth word, you want to set the most significant bit of the last character of the name. Um, if I were to change that, I would have to modify the fourth code that, that scans the dictionary and so on. So macro assemblers can often do things like this, but it's awkward and it would be a, a specific thing. Let's see, uh, what else do I want to talk to here? I don't really want to go through fourth. For us, for the purposes of this project, it is a useful program that we will boot and we'll make sure it works. We can type things into it and it will give us responses that we can predict. Let's see, uh, okay, so project status. Assembler did some additional tinkering. You can see what I did there. I, I basically included in what I did. Um, I brought in a whole bunch of cold start stuff. <laughs> uh, I had a minimum boot. I guess that's still just an I-8080 boot ROM. Um, nope, that's not the new version. I was tinkering around, oh, BDEV boot ROM, there we go. <clears throat> what is the smallest possible boot prom I could construct? Let's say I had just some special circuitry so that you know, we, we just had a tiny, tiny prom that got mapped in at zero. And we could run out of that prom until we decided not to. What would be the smallest thing? Um, and here we are. Um, this would be very simple. We establish a stack. And we push the stack address onto the stack. Because we are going to read in uh, BD res. We'll reset the disk controller. Read in data from the start of the first sector of the first track of the first drive into memory, increment it until L gets to zero, which would be 80 hex to 100 hex. And then we return, which branches to 80 hex. So this is the smallest possible boot image, boot prom image. And it would need to be mapped in until this return happened. And when we returned at that point, the boot prom would have to be mapped back out again. So this would take some support from the system to do. But if we get to where I'm, comf I'm comfortable having a boot disk in drive A when we power up, this could be our entire boot ROM with good 64 kilobytes of memory. This is just tinkering. This is just thinking. We're not going to commit to this yet. But this is a potential thing we can do to have a completely RAM-based system. And I think that is all. Uh, so I am going to call this a stream and down at the bottom, I have documented in the description, our current project status and what happened while I was not streaming for a week ish. Uh, and down at the bottom, I have promoted a couple of my private long-term goals up to medium term, which is booting and running fig forth and booting and running CPM 2.2. And we're going to choose long-term goals once we've got those going. I've got some things in mind, but uh, there we go. And I think I've been streaming this in the wrong category. Let me fix that up. This is science and technology. Yeah, 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 I've goofed. Um, let me find... There we go, and put it on the correct playlist. I don't think anybody connected to the stream, so no, no real problems there. Uh, set the rest properly. Okay. So it's been a stream. Uh, when we come back, I will start working on coding for various things. And that will probably be tomorrow.
I will see you then. Until then, yeah, keep it small, keep it fast, and keep it safe.